everyone. I'm Elise Burkhofer, and I'm the Global Head of Women at Google. I am so excited today to be moderating a very special talk at Google with Deborah Liu. Deb is a seasoned technology executive based in Silicon Valley. She's currently the president and CEO of Ancestry, the company at the forefront of family history and consumer genomics. Prior to this, she served on the leadership team of Facebook, where she was vice president of the Facebook app commerce and previously spent several years at PayPal. She also serves on the board of Intuit and is co-founder of the nonprofit Women in Product. She's also now the author of Take Back Your Power, 10 New Rules for Women at Work. I am so excited to get to chat with her today all about her journey and the book. Warm welcome, Deb. Thank you so much. It is wonderful to be here. So I'm so excited to get to chat with you about this. Um, I'm first just curious to hear how uh, the book week launch is going. You launched your book a couple of days ago. It's out now. How is it feeling? How's it been going? It's great in that, you know, the world has changed so much, actually. I was just um, thinking about what most authors used to do, a book tour, you know, you go bookstore to bookstore in a month in now it's all virtual. I'm, I'm actually going to be in a bookstore uh, physically for one bookstore event. But outside of that, it's been all virtual. And it's been amazing to kind of see and be able to connect with people I probably would never have been able to do in a traditional book tour. Amazing. Well, we're so excited to have you here at Google. And before we get into all the book, I'd love to just hear a little bit more around your background and career journey. So many folks are probably wondering how you've gotten to uh, the place you're at today, the CEO of a major company, um, got to read your bio, but share a little bit more about, about how you got here. Well, you know, 20 years ago, I was graduating from Stanford. I had gotten my MBA, I had been consulting before, and I totally stumbled into tech. I saw a table for this startup at the time, a few hundred people called PayPal. And there Tim Wenzel and Catherine Wu were, and he had put together the PayPal Mafia. So he said, hey, do you want a job? And I said, no, I actually came to compliment your product. And suddenly mm -hmm. the next day I was interviewing, and a few days after that, I got a job. And within two or three weeks, I was actually working at PayPal. And so it was an incredible journey. And you know, I was working on the eBay business, and suddenly we were acquired. The next week after that, we were actually acquired by eBay. And I led the eBay PayPal integration for a couple of years, and it was just such a front row seat to everything happening in tech at the time, learning about integrations, learning about tech. And then eventually I went on to lead the buyer experience at um, eBay. And then after a couple of years, I went to Facebook to work on consumer monetization. And I've been on the tech side for most of that time. Um, and it's been just an incredible um, opportunity to see you know, companies start from a few hundred people to become massive um, successes. Amazing. What a journey. Yeah, those career booth days, getting to see a, a startup like PayPal and then now where it is and your journey. It's amazing. So you're obviously a, a super busy woman. You're uh, super successful in your career. Uh, what was the inspiration for this book? What was the moment when you knew, you know, I've got something here I'd like to, to put into words? You know, if you had told me 10 years ago that I would be writing a book, I wouldn't have believed you. Because to be honest with you, I just never saw myself as a writer. But, you know, about eight years ago, I actually started this open door policy. I was teaching the new hire PM class at Facebook. And, you know, I had been, I had felt so alone in different parts of my career. And I said, you know what, at the end of the class, I said, I have an open door policy. Call me anytime. You're going to need somebody sometime. And some people would call me and ask me how to help them pick a team. But a lot of people would call me a year or two years later and they ran into their first hurdle. They can't get promoted. They have conflict with their manager. And so I would do these coaching sessions and I still do it to this day. I have coached over a thousand, mostly women, most, everyone who reaches out to me, I practically as a woman. Mm -hmm. And as I coach them, I realized that a lot of the commonalities of their stories were very similar. And I can't reach more than a thousand women in eight years. But, you know, if I wrote this in a book, it would be an opportunity to really reach all of those people that I just would never have a personal touch with and to share some of the lessons that I've learned through that experience. I love that, thinking about the scaling of your coaching and mentorship and being able to share your story more broadly. So thank you for all the work that you do uh, to be so accessible to folks and thanks for making it even more accessible with the book. Yes. Beautiful. So um, the book's called Take Back Your Power. I'd love to understand what does power really mean to you? Well, I think we just have a really uncomfortable relationship with power, right? If you think about it, when I say, you know, you should take back your power, everyone cringes just a little bit. And I did that on purpose. And part of it is to say, power is not a dirty word. If you actually look it up in the dictionary, it means the ability to influence people and events around you. That's it. That's all it means. 
I think we've seen the lust for power, the desire to have power at all costs to be really damaging, but actually wanting to have impact on the world, that is what we're here for. And so I think that the word has been taken and used for other reasons, but taking back our power is to say, both taking back the word, but also the ability to influence around us. And so a lot of the book is about that. It's like, you know, how the world tells us you shouldn't want something, especially as a woman. Mm -hmm. There's a study I share in there about how there's two politicians. They, they actually did a study where they wrote the bios of two politicians. And they said, you know, the man says, I want power. The woman says, I want power. And the only thing different is their gender and their name. And mm -hmm. for the man, they're more likely to vote for him. They see it, they, people you know, said that it was something that they admire about him. For a woman, there were just, just such negative comments, including this evokes moral outrage. Think about that when you, the difference between these small differences between how men and women are seen and how women are then asked to give away their power in small ways. Like the, the last time you were asked to take notes, the last time they say, well, who's taking care of your kids? You know, my husband said, no one in my, my entire life has ever asked me that, <laughs> but I get asked that a lot. Oh, you do so much. You're the CEO of a company, of a nonprofit. You have three kids. Who takes care of your kids? And he just laughs every time that happens because there is a double standard. But by the way, mm -hmm. you know, in, in the workplace, I think something like 70 percent of families with children under 18 actually work full time. And so you think about just the stats and, and you know, I want to destigmatize actually saying, you know what, being able to influence the world around you. This is why we're here. Let's actually take back our power together. Yeah. Oh, I love that. And just the reminder of kind of going back to the definition of the word of, you know, the ability to influence, the ability to make an impact, you know, everybody wants that. So I love that you're working to to take away some of those maybe shadowy aspects of, of the word or ways that it can get out of hand. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So you have these uh, these 10 different uh, rules and uh, tools for, for women to take back their power. And I'd love to dig into a few of them because they were so resonant so important and i feel like there's a lot of, of value for the folks that are tuning in so one of the ones that really resonated with me was find your voice and i'd love to hear a little bit more about your journey of finding your voice and some of those tips that you have for helping folks and especially women really have that that clear and powerful voice that we all desire well you know i just so i grew up in a small town in the deep south and in south carolina and you know, I, my parents moved there when I was six. I was actually born in New York in Queens and I lived very close to a lot of our extended family. So I just, it never occurred to me that it was really different than everybody else. Mm -hmm. I get to a place where we look nothing like anybody else. And people would come up to us and say, go back to where you came from. And I just remember thinking like, what does that mean? You know, always being the other. And I realized if I just stopped talking, if I, if people didn't notice me, if I just like try to fit in as much as possible, then maybe nobody will comment. And so for years, I was like, just put your head down, do the work. Don't worry about those things. And you know, you're going to be, you're just going to kind of hide. And I learned to suppress my voice so much that by the time I got into the workplace, I didn't really know who I was and I didn't really have a voice. And mm -hmm. You know, there, there's a lot of things that they tell you. And one of the things in career advice is, you know, the things that work for you to get you to where you are today may not get you to where you need to go tomorrow. And that was what I, I hit this wall where, you know, I went into, um, I was at Boston Consulting Group and I was an associate and they said, look, your slides are great. Your analysis is great, but you're really bad at the client service part of client service. Mm -hmm. And it's because they said you need to hang out with the clients and spend time with them. And I was so introverted, so shy. So I really struggled to find my voice. I struggled to really kind of come into my own. And it took me years to kind of unpack that and unlearn that and to say, you know what, my voice matters. You know, and, and I use this quote, like you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. If you don't pitch that product, if you don't, you know, try that strategy, how do you know if it's going to fail? And, you know, mm -hmm. by presuming the answer is no, you definitely are going to miss it. And so I had to learn to speak up. I had to learn to tell my narrative. And, and I think a lot of times our background tells us, hey, maybe you shouldn't, you know, maybe you shouldn't speak up. You don't want to be too abrasive or too aggressive. But what are you missing? I think sometimes we look at the reverse strategy instead of saying, you know, what I shouldn't say, think about intentionally what you should say. Yeah. Wow, thank you for sharing all those those parts. And yeah, you touched on a few things I'd love to go um, a little deeper on. First of all, some of it sounds like the cultural aspects of how you were conditioned maybe to, to um, not or to diminish your voice a little bit. I know that's something that we talk about a lot with our Asian women's community at, at Google. Can you share a little bit more about how you kind of broke through maybe some of those binds or the, the cultural conditioning? 
I think so many people live in different cultures. And I grew up in, you know, my parents were immigrants, my in-laws were immigrants. And I grew up in a culture that said it's a collectivistic society, right? It's very hierarchical, mm. it's very collectivistic. Don't stand out too much. My parents like put your head down, do the work, and then they'll recognize mm. it. That's mm -hmm. not how American companies work. That's not how the workplace works here. And so you're basically unpacking all the cultural understanding that you have. And there's a lot of communities for which this is true. And so you know, but we we have one model of success. I wish we had more models of success. I wish we had different forms. But right now, in the in the system we live in today, you kind of have to figure out how to navigate. And so I really struggled with that, honestly. And one of the biggest biases I ever found, I wrote about this in my Substack recently, was the biggest bias that I see in the workplace is actually people able to speak up on a dime on any topic, to be able to participate. Mm -hmm. And if you're a processor, if you're introverted, if English is not your first language, think about what a disadvantage that places you. And, you know, presentations and kind of speaking to others might be 5% of your job, but it's 50% of how you're judged. And mm -hmm. I've just seen that time after time. And so, so much of what we, you know, finding your voice is really kind of figuring out how you want to navigate a system that wasn't built for the way that you grew up or the way that you, you exist. And so what do you do about it? You can't fix it overnight. And I wish I had a magic wand, but in the meantime, we have to live in an imperfect system. And a lot of the rules are you got to pick the, you know, be intentional, choose the things that you're going to do and do them. Mm -hmm. That's super, super helpful. And then you also spoke about being an introvert. And I think a lot of people don't think of CEOs uh, as introverts. So how do you manage being an introvert and also work with how much you have to be out in the public eye and building relationships? What do you do to take care of yourself and honor maybe the time you need alone or any parts of coming along with introversion as a leader? Well, you know, introversion is well, how you get energy, right? Mm -hmm. And you, I realized that I struggled with you know being at work and being exhausted because you're talking so much and you're asked mm -hmm. to speak up. But at the same time, that was what was required. At one point in my career, I realized that by being introverted, by never speaking, I was asking other people to do the work, to draw me out, to get my ideas. And I say, you know, I don't want to put that burden on other people. So I'm going to change, I'm going to change the equation. I'm going to change the way I do things. And it really changed my mindset, which was, yes, I get, I don't get energy. And yes, this is how I was born and that's okay. However, I can learn the skills and I treat it like a skill building activity. So mm -hmm. I force myself to speak. How many times did I speak in this class? How many times did I speak in this meeting? What was the quality of that? And when you built yourself and you actually have metrics around it, it makes a huge difference because now you're actually choosing intentionality. I have a friend, Carol Izazaki, she's a, a leadership trainer and she calls it um, ridiculous, unintentional, ridiculous strategies that we employ, which is I'm introverted. So I'm going to go into a room and nobody goes, I'm going to go in this meeting and add nothing. You know, nobody decides ahead of going to a big presentation. I'm just going to sit in the back of the room <laughs> or I'm going to, you know, drain the energy out of the room. But instead, like how many times have you realized you've done that? And I realized as an introvert, I was mm -hmm. allowing that to happen. So I had to choose to change how I was doing things. And it took me some time and effort to do that. And it, But at the same time, I realized that, you know, it's not just about some people are like, well, don't you feel like it's unfair that you have to conform? And I said, no, that is absolutely true. There's a lot of studies that show men are successful if they're competent and women are successful and seen as leaders if they're competent and warm. Is that fair? Mm. Absolutely not. But if you want to be a leader, you kind of have to choose what does it mean to be warm? And I read that study and I thought, I'm not warm. I'm also not extroverted. This is going to be really hard. But but I realized that everything can be learned. And if you treat it as a skill, it changes your the way you look at it. So I'm still mm -hmm. extremely introverted. My husband actually is a lawyer and he's a general counsel and head of partnerships for a startup. But he's an extrovert. And so at the end of the day, he wants to talk. And I'm like, I'm out of words for today. Thank you. But it's <laughs> okay. Like, you know, and I, we get a lot of energy from our kids instead. I love that. I'm out of words for today. That's a great one. I'm going to have to to use that. Yeah. Thanks for that reminder of just how you might have a different strategy of needing to recharge and also have you built the skills and actually set goals around, um, you know, still being able to, to chime in and, and participate. Uh, you've also shared a few really great tips um, and just awareness builders for how people might be undermining their power without knowing it with th simple things that they're saying, like, you know, sorry to bother you and things like that. Can you share a few of those common things that you might hear that you'd like to help shift people's awareness around and, and maybe bust those uh, habits? 
well, I do this a ton. You say the word just, I just want to, you know, sorry to bother you, but I don't know that much about this yet. You know, mm. but you, you're basically saying, dismiss me before I've spoken. And so I ask, especially when you're doing writing to actually go back to what you've written and take out those qualifiers. You don't need those qualifiers. You don't deserve to have, you, you don't deserve to have someone dismiss you. And so instead, just put yourself out there. And the answer might be yes, the answer might be no, but this doesn't soften the blow either way. And feel, and I, the other part is, I think a lot of times, and especially women do this a lot, I'm sorry to bother you. I am sorry that, you know, the, apologizing. Mm -hmm. I found myself doing that a ton because it's a way to kind of, diminish yourself to kind of give the other person comfort. But at the same time, why are we apologizing for existing, for speaking, when actually that's part of the work that we do? And so I want to pull that back and say, you know what, all of us should just look at our words, they should be there should be something like grammarly for removing words like, I am sorry, but it's not actually an apology. And it actually it's a diminishment of ourselves. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. We actually had some Google folks build a, a Chrome extension that, that oh, helped work on that for emails. So uh, I'm going to yeah, use it. Thank you for those reminders. Yeah. Awesome. Well, super, super helpful tips on finding your voice. And thank you for sharing about, about that key rule. Um, the next one I wanted to get into was embrace who you are. And you've mentioned that this was maybe one of the harder rules for you to embrace yourself. You shared a bit about your background. Can you share about why embracing who you are is so important as we take our power back? I think part of it is that we, you have something really special about yourself. And a lot of times we dismiss it. So one thing I, I, for years, I would have, I had this idea that we should build Facebook marketplace and I introduced it in 2009 in my interview with Cheryl and she politely nodded and then put that aside. And, you know, I got the job, but it was to do something totally different. And I kept saying like, I see something that no one else sees. I see this opportunity. But I was one, I was the only mom PM at the company for many, many years. And I could see how powerful this could be, building community commerce, building the ability to connect. And everyone else just couldn't see it. People would ask me, like, why would anyone want to buy anything on Facebook? And I'm like, what do you mean? Mm -hmm. Today, the product has over a billion people. But I remember talking to my career coach and she said, trust your voice. There's something about you're seeing something other people don't see. Just keep at it. And years went by. And by the way, I didn't start working on that product. So I interviewed in 2009. I didn't start working on that product, I think, until 2015. And, you know, but I found a group of like-minded people who said, you know what, we should build this. Let's go figure out how to make it happen. And I think sometimes if you see something special, maybe it comes easy to you, but it's hard for other people. So figuring out what is that superpower? What is the thing that, that makes you different? That What is the angle in the world that you see that other people don't see and are dismissing? And that's where you're, you should bring that to the table. It's easy to say, well, if no one else notices it, it never happens, right? It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. But actually, you know, for every founder, it's because they found a problem that they feel like they could see the problem clearer than anyone else and they're going to mm -hmm. solve it. It's not like Google's the first search engine or Facebook is the first social network, you know, and that's the thing. It's like solving a problem a different way, seeing how to do something better. Trust yourself. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah, everyone having their superpower, everyone having their own insights that could bring something really magic to the to the table. And wow, that's a long time for a pitch to happen for a product to come to life. I'm sure that was super rewarding to see it finally built and succeed. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Awesome. Another uh, rule that you talk about in the book is learn to forgive. And I love that you brought this element up. Um, I studied psychology at Stanford and forgiveness was such a, a cool piece. I actually took a whole class on it. I feel like it's one of our greatest um, you know, abilities to move through things, forgiving ourselves, forgiving others, and something that we're not great at as, as humans. So tell me about forgiveness and kind of what that's meant for you as you have taken back your power. Well, I think sometimes, you know, I remember there was somebody I, was, I had work conflict with. And then one day my coach says to me, when are you going to put down the backpack? And I'm like, what do you mean? And she's like, you come in here and you talk to me and you add yet another rock into this backpack, except that you're the person carrying the backpack. Mm -hmm. And I just and I just looked at her and I thought, whoa, you know, you're right because it was one sided. Like I don't even know if that person noticed that they were slighting me, interrupting me or causing these issues. And I was the one carrying the load. And mm. so I putting it down was a huge step, which was, you know, forgiveness. Sometimes we, we just need to let go of something, you know, something bad mm. happens to us at work, some, you know, something, a decision is made and 
we are just upset and we're angry. It is okay to sit in that feeling and then it's time to let it go. You know, somebody, you know, somebody said that um, the, basically hate is um, drinking poison and hoping the other person dies. Like you're mm. basically poisoning yourself. And one of the things that I talk about is how for lack of forgiveness at work and at home and in your relationships can really be a huge burden to you. And it also causes stress. It causes health problems. And so really kind of letting go of those things, processing them and releasing yourself. It's not really necessarily that you're doing it for them, but forgiveness is freedom for you. Mm -hmm. And so really kind of taking a step back. But the other part is I notice there's a lot of mom guilt when I, when, you know, there's as a parent early on, it's like, I should do this, like breastfeeding versus mm -hmm. formula, you know, which diaper is like everything. There's a lot of guilt and there's a lot of regret. And I decided when my son was born, I just couldn't do that. You know, if I didn't spend a lot of time with him this week and I felt bad about it, I'm just going to spend more time with him next week and so on and so forth. And now mm -hmm. three kids, you know, balancing that all out. But rather than kind of looking backwards, you can't move forward by looking backwards in your life. And so forgiving yourself and letting go of the regret and using that to actually change the way you live in the future, that's super powerful too. And I think that's why forgiving others and forgiving yourself are two of the most powerful things. And I actually wrote that chapter first interestingly enough. Wow. I think in the whole book, I, I kind of had chapter one halfway going and then this was the first chapter I finished. Wow. That's really cool that that was the first chapter. Yeah, I, I fully agree. It's just so important for both the self and other that it's actually, it's it, we're the one kind of facing the pain when we haven't forgiven. So thanks for sharing that analogy of the backpack. I think that'll, that really resonates. Yeah. Cool. So I'd love to talk a bit about um, support systems. You talk about the need for developing allies and really having folks around you. So first off, because I know everyone can be um, allies and support one another, but how have you built your network of sisterhood over time in, in your journey? And what's been that role of women's network? Well, you know, there's actually four kinds of allies that we have, right? Mentors who give you advice sponsors who open doors for you, your team, and those are the people who are laboring by your side, kind of carrying your vision, carrying the product forward, carrying your, your strategy forward, and then your circle. And you know, you're talking about the network of circles. I think that is so powerful, which is these are people outside of work who are the people who support you. And I've been part of three lean in groups. The last one just had our reunion post COVID and it was amazing this past weekend. But these are the people who, who pick you up when you, when you fall down and when you're struggling, they're the ones who say, you got this. And they're also the ones who open doors for you when you, know, you say, I'm thinking about doing X. They give you the advice you need and support you through a transition. And so, you know, this is the um, the kinds of circles that sisterhood that that is really important. The same thing is true of my Bible study, which we've been in a different Bible study over the last 20 years. The last one is you know, just a small group of women. And, and I thank them in the acknowledgments of the book for listening to me mm -hmm. talk about this book for four years and finally getting it done. And yeah. so it is this kind of um, support that carries you through the hard times. I think everyone like Chuck Swindoll has this quote, you know, 10% of life is what happens to me and 90% is what I choose to do about it and how I react to it. And that's so mm -hmm. powerful and so true. And these are the people who say, you know what, that happens. Now what's next? Let's go. You know, they let, they mourn with you for that moment. You need to mourn. And then they say the path, the future is here. So let's figure this out together. And so I hope everyone has that. If you don't create that for yourself, find a group of like-minded women to support you because it is so powerful. Coaching circles, mentoring circles, lean in circles. There's a lot of um, organizations that help provide this. And I think it's really important in your career as well as your home life. Amazing. Amazing. And you even helped um, found uh, women in product as a nonprofit, you know, what's the value been for you and kind of bringing women together of specific backgrounds, you know, working on product? What has that been like? Well, you know, it, the whole women in product started because I started at a time in product where it was half men, half women. And a lot of the leaders were actually women. A lot of the women VPs I worked for early on. In fact, I was on the senior staff of Amy Clement when she was the head of product for PayPal. And all of the directors of product around her table were women at one point. And so I, I get to Facebook this many years later and I look around and I'm like, where are all the women? Mm -hmm. And something had happened in between actually, you know, Google had decided to require a computer science degree in 2004. And so a lot of people who didn't have computer science degrees had a hard time transitioning into it. Mm -hmm. and again, it made sense for Google at the time, but it changed the way the industry looked at product management as a role. 
And so, you know, I went into actually went into Facebook, not as a um, product manager, but as in, in product marketing because of that. And a lot mm -hmm. of people did. they transitioned to other roles. And, you know, I realized that in order to get us back to a place where there's a lot of women leaders, we had to make changes. And so I was invited into product management at Facebook. And then, you know, and we realized three of the most successful women at the company actually didn't have computer science degrees. And it was a requirement mm -hmm. to even get a job there. So we thought, well, why is this? And all of us had come in through product marketing. And so, you know, we dropped the computer science requirement and the quality mm -hmm. of PMs went up, not down. And so we're just opening the pool to more people. And then, then we dropped the technical interview. We dropped some interviews that we felt like weren't adding a lot to, to the process. And suddenly the numbers of women just suddenly crept up and crept up and crept up. And so, you know, sometimes it's these small things. And so, you know, we, because there were so few women, we actually started these dinners and actually Google's an early supporter as well. We'd have these dinners together and we would just invite women that we knew across the industry. And we did these dinners for four years. And then one night at one of these dinners, I'm not sure what possessed us. We said, who's going to Grace Hopper? And a few of us raised our hands. And then we said, why isn't there a women's conference for PMs? And then we said, we should create one. And suddenly a bunch of strangers at dinner decided we're going to create a conference, which by the way, is the most insane thing. Um, <laughs> we ended up gathering you know, a group and we said, okay, who's interested? And early on, we had women representing different companies across the Silicon Valley. And we, we um, opened up registrations. So we had 300 slots. Facebook decided to sponsor the first one. And then eventually Google has sponsored all of the ones since then, mm -hmm. and a bunch of other companies. And you know, the first one, we had 300 slots and some over 3,000 people applied. And we just wow. thought, wow, there's something here. And mm -hmm. so now the organization is 30,000 people in our membership. And we have um, we have chapters in two dozen cities. And it's just so incredible to see women help each other and find jobs, you know, help each other interview, open doors for each other, mentor each other. And now they're recreating coaching circles. And so it's such a great way for women to connect with one another and help each other in an industry where we were almost pushed out, you know? And so it's yeah. great to see us make a huge comeback, but also the, the ranks of product management where a lot of founders and VCs and, you know, mm -hmm. who, who, who rise to the C-suite come from. And so by, you know, nurturing this group, I think we will continue to grow and help the industry hear more voices and build better products. Wow, amazing. I love that it came together over a casual dinner. It's quite a feat to be taking on putting on a conference um, like that. And thank you for bringing up some of that um, background too, around a well-intentioned uh, kind of qualification being created for a job actually limiting um, the potential pool for amazing candidates. And I'm so grateful that that has shifted over time and can really think about the transferable skills that everyone can have um, and shift over into different role types and job ladders. And we see lots of non-technical women transitioning into our technical roles now, which is amazing. Excellent. Okay, so we talked a bit about this uh, circle aspect and that like support group. Uh, you also brought up mentors and sponsors when we talked about that allyship category. And, um, you know, I love thinking about mentors as folks that are talking to you, helping, really giving you that advice, that guidance, sharing the way, and sponsors really talking about you when you're outside of the room and helping, helping help open up doors. So how have you cult cultivated your mentorship and sponsorship relationships through your career? You know, I think sometimes you you get a mentor and I've mentored a lot of people as well and you never tell them what happens, right? And mm -hmm. so the most gratifying mentoring relationships and this is how you turn a mentor into sponsors to say, you know, Lise, thank you so much for your advice. This is what I did and here's what happened. Mm -hmm. And here's what's next. By closing the loop, you're actually saying, you know, I'm worthy of your advice, but also your time. And I want to do more. So help me. And you're really bringing that person alongside you on the journey, not just saying, OK, I'm going to a guru, getting you know advice and then moving on. And so, you know, as you have mentors, I encourage you to take their advice, but then come back and say, this is what I learned. And here's what happened because and thank them. I think we just don't appreciate the mentors that we have enough. And then the second thing is turning them into sponsors. You know, sponsor is somebody who you know, chooses you. And so it's really hard. People always ask me, how do you get a sponsor? And the first thing is to be worthy of sponsorship. So really, you know, turning your mentor, or your manager into sponsor, but also like really unpacking what they're looking for. A lot of times people tend to sponsor people like them because, you know, the things I hear is like, oh, you know, I, I support this person because they're a lot like me 10 years ago. 
Well, here's the challenge, right? In the leadership positions of companies, people who are like you might not be there, right? And so how do you actually cultivate that relationship? Some of my most amazing sponsors were women, but a lot of them were men. And I talk about a lot of the stories of that as well. And so how do you actually turn your manager into your sponsor so that they can help you advance your career, but also you can help them by showing that you, you know, that you're, you're a growth, you're have a learning mindset that you're growth oriented. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that. Those are great tips and actually circling back and helping people understand what value they're bringing to you as a mentor and really earning sponsorship, doing that, doing that great work that helps get you the visibility and opportunities you desire. Awesome. So you brought up men and men playing a big role in, in a lot of your mentorship and sponsorship. Uh, would love to talk more about, you know, what role do you see men playing in helping advance gender equity, especially in the workplace? Well, I think men, you know, are such incredible allies. I've had amazing mentors and sponsors who've been men and, and it's, you know, really powerful. And I think that you know, they can continue to really be a part of, of the, the work that we do to actually bring more equity. Part of the reason I wrote this book is chapter one is meant to depress you is what I say in the book, because there's a lot of stats that I think even, you know, a lot of women feel it, but maybe haven't read it, but a lot of men don't even see it at all. And so really, how do we, how do we actually amplify that and help them see the playing field is not level? but that you know their help can actually make it a little easier for us. And so it is really that partnership. But you know without even all those stats so many men have been so incredible and I talk a lot about my turning points and how they have been amplifying my work, giving me the opportunity reaching out and I think that each of us have a role to play to helping each other whether men or women. Amazing. So helpful. Yeah. And when folks do look around the workplace and say, gosh, I don't feel like I have allyship, I'm not getting the support they need. What, what sort of guidance do you have for folks then? Well, part of it is, you know, first, I think it's not just incumbent on the person. A lot of it is incumbent on the workplace. Mm -hmm. Is the workplace a place where you feel safe, where you feel like you can ask for help, where you feel like, you know, if you need a mentor, that, that your, your manager or your peers are there for you? A lot of that is cultural. And so really kind of building a culture of care is critical, mm. especially when there are people in, in your ranks who feel vulnerable or who are struggling with different things. And this is not just about men or women, but across many different challenges. The second thing though, is really, you know, finding your first, finding a team, a place, and a, you know, whatever you're working on, start with your team as the best allies because you're laboring alongside each other to bring an idea to life, to bring an execution to life. Those should be your closest you know, people first. And then talk to your manager, skip levels, people you admire, and really kind of cultivate that mentoring relationship. Ask for advice. People actually you know, think, oh, I don't wanna bother you, but, but they love being asked for advice you know, because you're, you're honoring their wisdom. Right? Just send a note and say, hey, I love your advice on X. You know, would you be open mm -hmm. to, you know, a, a five minute conversation about X or, you know, those, that's the kind of thing where, look, not everyone's going to say yes. And you're risk, you're risking hearing no, but you know, mm -hmm. they say yes, probably 60 to 80% of the time. And so that's a pretty good batting average. And so I would just open yourself up to that. Yeah. I love that. Those are such great tips. I love the culture of care and really thinking about, you know, building those relationships upwards and and asking people for advice, opening up the door for what people naturally love to do. All right, I've got a couple more questions before we open it up to audience Q&A. So if you do have questions for Deb, please go ahead and type them in the chat and we're excited to take those soon. Um, I wanted to ask a bit about your guidance just to organizations who are thinking about how can we create more uh, a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive workforce? What are the top things that you really are calling in leaders, and I believe everyone's a leader, to think about this as they, as they lead their organizations forward? Well, I think that the way we set up processes is really important. And this is not just process like HR processes. I mean, how we do meetings. Like one example is for people who need more time to process, you know, sending out pre-reads ahead of time taking the time in the meeting to go around the room so everyone has an equal voice. Those are really small bias interrupters that make a huge difference. If you actually look like even in the most powerful places, like, you know, they, they I don't know if you read an article, but it was like Obama, the women of Obama's administration had to amplify mm -hmm. each other to get heard, right? Mm -hmm. That is just, you know, the Supreme Court, like they, there was somebody did a study a few years ago that women justices were interrupted more and spoke less. So now they go justice by justice. And the point mm -hmm. is that even at the highest levels where people are peers, this happens. And so how do we actually change 
the way we lead and the way that we run companies so that it opens it up to have more ideas come to the fore that people feel more comfortable. And that's hard, right? I think it's, but it's really thinking not just, well, people just spoke up more. Yes, we should do that. But we can also change the way we do things to make sure that people feel more comfortable speaking up as well. And so I, I, that is one of the things that I hope for. You know, in the book, I talk about what you can do individually, but we can mm -hmm. do so many things systematically too as leaders as well. Absolutely, yeah. And leveling that playing field for everyone's uh, voice to be really valued in a meeting, everyone to, to know that everyone has something to add and contribute in creating that culture. Such a good reminder, thank you. All right, um, my last question before I open up to audience um, is around finding that balance at home and at risk of asking about motherhood. We know we talked about some of the things of, oh gosh, as a woman, we take these questions and as men don't, I know you do have some wisdom to, to offer around how you've navigate, navigated your few kids at home and how you also hold this amazing leadership position and have just finished writing a book, which is a huge undertaking. So what, what's your guidance for parents um, as they navigate, you know, caring for family while also pursuing careers? One is, I do think it's important that your workplace is supportive. Like one of the things I love about Ancestry and the reason I joined is that it's a very family friendly company. It's been around for 35 years. It's very family oriented. And I love that it's a culture that has that it feels like home, right? It's, it's very supportive of families. And that is really important to me. And leading a company that, that does that and had that history makes it a lot easier also for me to to feel at home here but more than that you know i think balance at home sometimes you know there is a lot of bias in the way that things happen right the kinds of questions i told you that i get that my husband doesn't get but it's also the way that we set up work you know one of the things that um that happens was i remember there were there were several women who had children at the same time on my team and they told me after they went came back from maternity leave they had to leave on the 4 30 bus and we had all of our happy hours around five o'clock, you know, so mm. like really thinking about, wow, we were basically excluding a lot of because, you know, to make it back, especially if you live further away, you had to make it back before day, daycare closed. Right. And so we, we changed the time we had happy hours, for example. And so workplaces that do that, that are conscious of that is important. The other thing is balance at home, especially for women, is incredibly important to the future success for your career. As Cheryl said, the most important career decision you make is who you choose to marry. And that is absolutely true. I mean, imagine having a really supportive spouse versus one that puts all the load on you. And, you know, we have, my husband, as I said, is a lawyer, we've negotiated everything and it's amazing. Like he takes, you know, we never micromanage each other. We have what we call a swim lane marriage. We take care mm -hmm. of our lane and we take care of things so that we never, the other person never has to think about it. You know, when we go on vacation, he plans every trip, sends me a Google Doc, and he tells me where to show up. But I'm the one who makes sure that we have food, that we take care of like all the packing, and he never thinks about packing. And so, again, we just have such an, a great partnership that's a yin and yang. And, and it's, it has been such, a, and we've been married for over um, 20 years, and, you know, raising three kids and having tough jobs, I think that that's made it possible. But unfortunately, it's not possible for everyone. You know, if you're a single mm -hmm. parent or if you have an unsupported spouse, what do you do? And I wish there was an easy answer. Part of it is having a workplace that's supportive, but part of it is negotiate the things you can do, you know, outsource the things that you can afford and really get help if you can. And I want to destigmatize having help. By the way, mm -hmm. somebody, a founder whispered to me, hey, you know, I have an au pair. And I said, you know, who else has an au pair? Your husband. And like he, it just isn't something that anyone would ever be embarrassed about, yeah. you know? And so, so don't be embarrassed about it. It's okay. And so I do think it's one of those things where we, you know, when you say you had help, a lot of people go, oh, well, you're privileged. And yes, I was incredibly privileged, but men have had help for the last, you know, hundred years. They have stay at home spouses. They, the whole structure mm -hmm. is really different and they're never asked, well, who takes care of your kids? And so you just really be small these small things make women feel like, oh, maybe I shouldn't be doing this. And instead, we should actually be lifting them up and saying, how can we help each other? Mm -hmm. I love that, the being able to ask for help, the being able to find your strengths and what sort of things you each want to take on in partnership. Um, that's that's really, really helpful. And also honoring everyone who's chosen not to have parents and yeah. those decisions too. Um, yeah. Okay, awesome. So I'm excited to move into audience questions. If we could have our tech team pull up the first audience question. I've been seeing some awesome comments come through. 
Ashley says, great to see you, Elise. Great to see you too, Ashley. Um, and thanks so much, Deb, for your wisdom. Question for Deb, what is your advice for handling jealousy amongst other women? You know, I think that, so first, I think that for the most part in my career and almost always, women have been one of the biggest supporters and allies and friends, but it's not always the case, you know? And I think that in professional settings, sometimes it's it's hard, right? You know, one, one study about queen bee syndrome, as they call it, which I hate, by the way, about queen bee syndrome is that often it's when, you know, it feels like there's only one slot for a woman or one slot for a minority, that's when it comes out, right? It's because you're competing for something. In actuality, for the most part, and, and in general, women, when they enter the C-suite, bring in more women. When they join a board, more women join. It is really, you know, they're lifting other women up. But that does happen. And I think sometimes maybe just sitting down and having a conversation saying, hey, I noticed this. How can we be better allies? Because I think we can, you know, destigmatize, you know, the, some of the some of this, if we just sat down and had a conversation, and mm -hmm. said, you know, I'm feeling a little bit of something coming from you. Can we can we have this talk? You know, because lifting each other up, both of you will get further if you actually help you know carry each other across some of the more difficult circumstances. So turn them into an ally if possible. That's not always possible, but it is important that you you make that attempt. And if it doesn't work, I think sometimes just saying, you know what, I'm going to let this go. You know, sometimes the answer is I can't win every battle. I'm going to let this go and I'm going to find a way around as opposed to through. Yeah, I love that tip about even being able to name something and, and kind of turn someone into an ally because I often think when we're jealous of somebody, it's just something we admire in them. It's something mm -hmm. we're actually desiring for ourselves. So being able to even compliment them on that and kind of spin it all on its head. Yeah, could help you build a relationship and even support one another and also not battling for these few seats. If we can really understand that the more we support and lift each other up, yeah, the more opportunities there are for, for all of us as women to thrive. Yes, Great. it's not okay. a zero sum game. It definitely is not. Totally. Yeah, thanks for the question, Ashley. Next question. Okay, Vandana says, question for Deb, intrigued by competent and warmth. I think that's when we were talking about um, the expectation yeah. of, of women. Can you share tips on how to bring in warmth while also um, being competent? You know, the warmth things I struggled with for a long time. I remember talking to my coach and saying, I feel like I walk into a room and I'm terrible at reading people and mm -hmm. I'm squinting and I don't have any glasses. And she said, let's figure out how to get you some glasses. And I thought, okay, this is going to be really hard because I am not a warm person. But it took me a long time where I realized that a lot of what people see as warmth is empathy. And so, you know, it's really kind of saying, hey, you know, what can I do to help you today? Like, what is something I can, you know, asking, spending like an extra couple minutes in a meeting, asking how someone feels, you know, opening it up, not just getting straight to business, but actually saying, you know, can we go around the room and say how, you know, can we check in and see how everyone feels? These small things actually make a huge difference in the kind of warmth that we, you know, people perceive from you. And a lot of it, it I realized was really showing care. I was like an all business, get it done, to-do list. I am a type A thinker. And I realized I just was ignoring people's feelings. And mm. it took me a long time to get past that. And it took me a long time to process first what I need to do and then to do it. But as, as I took the time, I realized that I could see people more clearly too. And I got the glasses and I could see how people's body, the body language was and what their tone was. And I noticed when pe things were off. And so cultivating warmth isn't some huge change in your personality. A lot of it is how other people perceive you. And so it's really kind of showing care. And I think that's the first step. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you for those. Yeah, really actionable tips about even just checking in how folks are doing, yeah, warming up the room. Wonderful. Okay, next question. We've got from Erin. Hi, re-credibility. Can you please speak to how to build to it when new to an organization? Pivoting several times in my career, I can start at the bottom, not given the benefit of the doubt that perhaps um, we can lead. You know, one of the biggest issues in workplaces is that we treat everybody like they're here to learn from us and we have nothing to learn from them. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I heard this from a different company. They said what they do is when someone comes into their group, they first put them in the hot seat and do a kind of brown bag lunch and say, what can we learn from you? I love that because it gives people the moment of expertise before they become the learner again. And I think more organizations should definitely do that. 
you know, what can we learn from you? Because we hired you for a reason. We brought you over for a reason. And yet then we tell you, okay, you have to learn our way of doing things. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's incredibly powerful. I think the other thing is if you have an ally in the room, actually there's some studies that show that when men kind of go up and teach a class, people just give them like high expertise numbers, no matter what. But for women, they have low expertise numbers unless someone comes and introduces them. It doesn't make a difference when you introduce men, it, it's, their expertise numbers are the same. But when you introduce a woman, she, they, she, you know, her expertise numbers goes up. And so can you say, hey, this is Elise, she came from this other team, we're so happy to have her because she has had this level of impact and you know, she managed other teams before and we're really excited to learn from her. You know, having just one person kind of give you some cred credibility goes a huge long way, especially for women where, you know, people just go, well, you know, she's the new to the team. She has nothing to, to share with us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that idea of asking a teammate or your manager to help build up your credibility in your in your introduction and love the idea too about, yeah, just us really honoring what new um, ideas and expertise people can bring in. We're onboarding lots of folks on my team right now. So thanks for that reminder. Yeah. All right, next question. Got a bunch more to work through. Thanks everyone for the questions. Okay, Shruti says, being an introvert, what I've seen is I get very little benefit from conferences like Grace Hopper. I end up not making any meaningful relationships there. Any tips on how to improve that? Well, one is I found going to conferences really intimidating when I was extremely introverted. I would just kind of, I'd listen and or take notes and then I'd leave, you know? And it was just, mm. why are you even there? But being there is part of, part of actually is connecting and networking. So be intentional. You know, there are groups that set up ahead of a lot of conferences like, hey, let's do a meetup at X during lunch so that you feel like you have kind of an automatic network. You know, go with people you know, go with one or two people, especially extroverted people. That would be really incredible because that opens the door. I think sometimes we just forget that you know, you kind of, as an introvert, I have to say, I spent many years inside my own head going, well, you know, I'm here, I'm listening, but you treat it like a classroom. But what's the difference between that being in a classroom and being watching a video on Coursera, you know, instead, mm -hmm. it's really the interactivity, it's the human touch. And so, you know, telling yourself, here's my goal for this conference, I'm going to make five new friends, I am going to have lunch with different people, I'm going to, and you know, for, for those of us in tech, metrics matter, right? If you have a goal, and you have a metric, you're going to go hit it. But if you just go in, and again, this is the unintentional, ridiculous strategy, I'm just going to go to this conference and talk to no one said no one ever. Like That's a terrible idea. Instead, you're going because the people are there. And so really kind of just intentionally decide, here are three things I want to accomplish and how I'm going to measure it. And then measure yourself at the end. Love it. Love that. Yeah. And even, even knowing the little moments that can make a difference, like the person you sat next to at a chat, you know, asking them what they learned from it after. Those little moments can go such a long way. Love it. All right. Hope you get some Grace Hopper metrics in there. Okay. Uh, next question. We'll pull that up. Okay. Mona said, what is the best piece of career advice you've ever received? I think the most important thing is always be learning. You know, and this is the advice I would give myself if I'm starting out because I, every year I actually have these crazy New Year's resolutions. One of them was to create a newsletter and write every week, which was pretty nuts last year. And now I have a newsletter, you know, I had wanted to write more and now I have a book. Like I, and, and I've been doing these New Year's resolutions for many, many years. I have, I work out every day because of it. I floss every day. I quit sugary drinks. Like I've done so many different things and to challenge yourself, always be saying, Hey, and by the way, some things I try for a year, I'm like, okay, that is definitely not for me. And so, you know, <laughs> like really kind of be intentional and decide, and then always be pushing yourself to try something new. If you had told me I'd be an author, I would never have believed it. If you told me I'd be CEO someday, I would never have believed it either. But really kind of setting interim goals towards the things that you want and saying, hey, here is that's what gets you far. If you kind of allow your career to drift from job to job, you're not really kind of advancing, but really kind of looking five, two years, five years, 10 years out, where do you want to go? And then looking backwards and saying, how do I break down this problem? I think that's really powerful. Amazing. Love that. Always be learning. Absolutely. Lifelong learners and the resolutions that those goals are amazing. Okay. Next question. Uh, Sinan says, have you felt emotional at work? How do you manage those situations? Do you think showing emotion, especially for women, is viewed negatively? Well, you know, they said that women cry at work for two reasons. One is they're upset and two is they're frustrated. I have mm -hmm. definitely cried at work because I'm frustrated. 
I don't cry that often, but like when you're upset or frustrated, it is so easy to kind of let that overcome mm -hmm. you. And then the minute you do that, you feel so bad and you spend all your time regretting that it happened. Mm -hmm. And I just decided I was going to work past it. Right. I was just going to like it happened. That sucked. You know, you move on. And I think sometimes we just don't give your, ourselves permission to even be emotional at work because we feel like we have to like keep on the space. But, you know, things happen. They're really tough, you know, tough situations. When my manager left and he told me I was going to report to somebody who I had a terrible relationship with, I could just feel myself like getting extremely emotional and I almost quit my job on the spot. And I tell the story in the book and how it turned out. But um but it's just, you know, it's those moments that are turning points. And we can't expect people to be automatons. Like, I think sometimes we just expect that no one's going to have feelings. But of course they do. And I think we should honor those feelings and say, it's okay. Hey, do you need a moment? And then for us, when we, you know, just say, hey, can, I, can we loop back in this conversation in a couple hours? I just need a little time. It is okay to ask and to pause and to say time out. I think we should give ourselves permission to do that. Yeah. Thank you for that. And yeah, I'd love to normalize more emotion in the workplace for human beings who experience emotion. So folks of all genders have emotions. We all process them. We've been conditioned a little bit differently. So thanks for that reminder that it's okay to feel and it's okay to ask for time if you need it. Next question. Okay, Zandre said, how do you rewrite the narrative on preconceived notions that your coworkers may have? Well, I remember this one piece of feedback that people kept giving me and, you know, they, and so uh, the best piece of advice I had was own it, say, Hey, I've been told I am X and I am working on it. I would love your help by kind of you. You're basically calling out the elephant in the room and then saying, I am hoping to change it. Here's how you can help me. Like there was one person on my team who was struggling with something and, and he said, just call it out every time you see it because I don't see it. And we called him out a few times and suddenly he stopped doing it because but he acknowledged it in front of everybody. Like, hey, I need to work on this thing. Help me be my partner. And suddenly it changed the dynamic between like people going, well, why does he do that? To, oh, he wants to change. And so really mm -hmm. kind of owning it and saying, so for me, it was just that I am like, you know, I, I shared in, in the um, an article that basically Cheryl told me you can stop fighting now. You've won. I was just I had this chip on my shoulder. I was always fighting. I was super competitive and I had to stop. And so, you know, her advice is like, just acknowledge it. I need to work on this. I would love your help. And that was really powerful because suddenly you're turning an adversary into an ally. That's huge. That's huge. Turning those adversaries into allies. I love the way you're framing that. Thank you. Excellent. Okay. Got time for probably a couple more questions. We'll pull up the next one. Uh, Sheenam said, how do you handle interactions with strong dominating personalities who are not afraid to show their temper in the workplace? Something that many women don't have the luxury to show. And so the rest of that story is actually written in my book of how I dealt with it. But a lot of it is really coming to, to understand. Like I was really shrinking away from somebody with a really dominant personality. And I think that that made him even more upset and I didn't realize it. And actually sitting down and having a conversation saying, hey, when you push me, when you, when you speak like that, it intimidates me. And so I shrink more, which makes you want to draw me more out more by talking more at me. This is a problem. And so actually the, the, it's actually sitting down and saying, Hey, like, how can we, how can how, I feel uncomfortable when we talk like this? Like, is there a way that we can work together better? Sometimes just calling it out. And if you feel like you can't do that because it's somebody who's not close to you, the other way is to have allies. You know, there was one person who had a really strong personality in, this, in a lot of meetings we had. And so the women, we decided we were just going to counter that. We were going to say, you know, amplify each other. Like, no, what she said, you know, oh, I think she wanted to finish. And so these small things matter. So either confront it directly if you feel comfortable. If you don't, find a couple allies. One of the things that um, somebody was, they kept asking her the same question. I'm like, hey, can we just pause and not ask the same question all the time and just like revisit this in six months? It was just a small thing, but, you know, it was a huge relief to her. And so being a great ally, and people have done that for me as well. Amazing. Such great feedback and, and input. All right, next question. OK, 
Okay, Lauren says, how do you balance being sensitive to how others perceive you and remaining authentic and true to yourself? You know, it's interesting. Um, there's a story of Ami Vora, who I worked with. She's the head of product for WhatsApp. And uh, she said, you know, she got a ton of feedback early on. Like, you're too aggressive. You should speak up more. You should do this. You should do that. And then she said, at one point, she realized she got feedback. You don't have much of a personality. Like, she had sanded down her personality so much that they didn't mm. see anything. And so it's really about choosing. Like, being intentional about choosing what feedback you take. And then acknowledging, hey, you know, these are things that I can't change or I, I won't change. But really knowing who you are and being willing to do that, if you're constantly just reshaping yourself to fit into what other people's narrative is, you're really not going to be yourself. And so it's okay to choose to say, you know what, that was great feedback. I choose not to do that right now. And that is absolutely okay. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Just really giving that permission. I love it. Okay, we'll probably take one more question before we uh, wrap up. We'll pull one up. And sorry, we can't get to everyone. These are amazing questions. Hopefully, uh, reading Deb's book will help answer lots more. <laughs> okay, so Anastasia says, um, thanks for sharing the knowledge. Um, I'm a Noogler. That means a new Googler <laughs> at core. And wonder, how would you navigate the learning period while also establishing credibility and showcasing strength? So one thing I'd done is I, I created a 30, 60, 90 day plan when I joined as CEO of Ancestry. And so I posted it on my Substack. It's dubblue.substack. You can just search 30, 60, 90. And there's a template. And so really partnering with your manager to say, okay, what do I want to accomplish in the first 30 days, 60? And what I did was I did a listening tour. My first 30 days, I listened to 60 to 70 people. I talked to them individually, asked them the same questions, and I published the questions as well. And at the end, I kind of shared my learnings as a state of the union. And then we kind of put it together a plan, you know, but part of it was also having one or two quick wins, right? Like, you know, knowing, learning things by doing. So not just sitting back and absorbing. I think that was important as, as just a way to kind of learn how systems work. And it was kind of small projects that I picked up. And it's the same thing for you, really picking up, like have, being intentional about your first 90 days and how you onboard, getting your manager to be a great partner, asking people and telling them, hey, I'm new. I would love to talk to you. Here's, you know, and people are incredibly generous with their time. You're going to get yes most of the time and they're going to want to help you. And so use that time because you only get to be a newbie once and for a very short period. So you know, leverage that time and it's really precious and do as much as possible to kind of get onboarded. Awesome. Awesome. Um, I think maybe let's do try to do one more yeah. since you you've been okay. nailing through these so quickly <laughs> and we have lots more. So let's try to get one more in and then we'll we'll wrap. Thanks everyone for asking these awesome questions. Loving what's getting to come out and personalize these. Okay, so Shelly asks, what do you do if preconceived notions are false? How do you change the narrative? Talked a bit about this, but yeah. maybe one final well, word there. I do think that, you know, people just judge you for different reasons, but a lot of it is their experience too. So not just yours. They might experience you through their filter. So there's this thing we call behavior um, there's intent behavior perception. Your intent might be one thing. Your behavior might be an extension of that. But how someone perceives you is through the lens of their world. If they had met someone who looked like you or came from your background and said, oh, well, people without a computer science degree can't be a great X or people who are not technical can't do Y or whatever it is, they're judging you on things you don't even see. And so really kind of sitting down and understanding that and saying, OK, you know, my, my coach calls it, what is the movie in their head? That they're filtering mm -hmm. your language through. And you might be watching different movies because they're seeing, you know, something completely different from you. And to so really kind of understand, well, what is it about my intent that's causing me to have this behavior that they are misinterpreting through their lens and their perception is wrong? And then taking a step back, it doesn't mean you have to change the intent or even the behavior, but really acknowledging it and calling it out. I think sometimes we have this thing where we allow a lot of strategic ambiguity in conversations between people because it's uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And I just believe that calling it out actually builds stronger relationships. Say, hey, I feel like we're not on the same page here. You know, you're saying X and I'm saying Y. Can we talk about it? And just like, you know, defang the situation. I think sometimes we just allow it to kind of fester for a long time. Like, this is how it's gonna go. We're just gonna ignore it. And by the way, I ignored this for years in that situation I talked about until I had to report to him. And so, you know, how do you actually acknowledge and confront and then move forward? 
And sometimes those preconceived notions are right and sometimes they're absolutely wrong. But without acknowledging it, you're just allowing it to continue to fester. I love that approach of, yeah, just being direct and being able to address things kindly and clearly with people. Thank you so much for that invitation for folks. All right. Well, thank you everyone so much for joining us. Deb, it was such a pleasure to talk to you. I am so excited for everyone to get to read your book. We've got the link down in the uh, description of this uh, YouTube event of how to buy the book. Um, we'd love for as many people as possible to get to read and experience your wisdom. Are there any final words that you want to share with folks? I just, I hope people will read the book, but I also hope that, you know, you will thrive. Like one of the things that I talk about in the book is I just want everybody to, you know, really thrive in the workplace and you take back your power every single day and we can do this together. Yes, I love it. Thank you so much, Deb. It was such an honor to talk with you. Thank you for sharing all your wisdom. Thank you for writing the book and thank you for being with us here today at Google. And it was great being here. Great.